So, this is the second video on Hecuba, and this is the one where I show how the patterns of human life that Aristotle describes in his Ethics, Politics, um, many books, um, are, are demonstrated in the characters and the plot and all that sort of stuff, and why it follows tragedy. Okay, first of all, uh, in terms of polyxena, Aristotle talks about um, children and they need to be habituated for the virtues and they need to be actually acting according to justice but at a certain point in life they have to make that transition from acting justly because they're imitating somebody else or they're doing what they're told to becoming their own person, to having the power of choice. That's where they do it for the right reason, in the right way, at the right time, because it's the noble thing. And they don't do it for any other ulterior motive, to get honor from somebody else, to avoid punishment from somebody else, whatever. So that's the transition that Polyxena made. She acted on her free choice, and she's a great model for what it means to act uh, courageously and in full, okay, she has full knowledge of what's going on. She chooses it for its own sake, for the right reason in the right way. It's the best choice in the situation. <laughs> so she really doesn't have any options. Her only options are whether to be afraid or self-pitying or whether to be noble, whether to accept it and act the way she did. And all the other characters are whining and whining about how, oh, my hands are tied. I really feel sorry for you, Hecuba, but I have to kill your daughter. Or Agamemnon, oh, I really feel sorry for you, blood. And, <laughs> or Polly Nestor, oh, Agamemnon, I really had to, I was trying to please you, blah, blah. Okay, so they're all whining and fussing and and it's obvious that Polyxena is the one that acted nobly um, okay all four of the adults um, were guilty of vanity so the virtue of pride is knowing how, what how to honor and be honored so you know how to distribute honors because you know what honorable behavior is, you know how to give honor, you know when you're acting honorably or dishonorably. So, and the two extremes are that you don't have enough pride, you um, denigrate yourself too much, and the other extreme is um, you're vain. And he says um, people who are given power uh, but don't deserve it. They give it, they get it through birth rather than through merit or for the wrong reason. Um, they become, he says, they become disdainful and insolent and they do what they please. So all of these characters, the four, are like that, okay? They're vain about their own power. They think they're more powerful than they are. They think they're more virtuous than they are. They think they're um, acting in a way that'll recover some kind of justice or vindication. And, and they are disdainful toward each other and insolent, and they do whatever they want. And Hecuba's the one that knows she's doing exactly what she wants. The other ones are more deluded and uh, don't really, they find some kind of uh, justification for what they do. Um, okay, so uh, so they're all guilty of vanity, excess pride, irrational sense of honor. Um, anger in relationship to the virtue of anger. Um, uh, Hecuba clearly is at an extreme. She overreacts. Um, Odysseus gets too angry at Hecuba, um, and Polynestor gets too angry, and he 
prophesizes. Um, he tells Agamemnon, you're going to get killed because you're, you know, you killed your own daughter and your wife is going to kill you. And Agamemnon doesn't want to hear that. So he has him thrown off on some island to starve to death. Um, and uh, Odysseus is trying to be objective, but he really has this complex and he doesn't want to be crossed or questioned. Um, okay. Hecuba, though, is the most classic case of an extreme in relation to anger. They lack self-knowledge, right? And this is kind of redundant. They think they're more powerful than they are. They think they're more virtuous than they are. They think they're more just than they are. Um, okay. They, they rule. They're just poor rulers. They don't exercise their power wisely. Okay, so, so um, the, another thing, okay, so this play is mainly about the obligation of the nobility, about um, what rulers need to do, because their primary motive should be to, to protect their city, not only for security right away, but also may develop a reputation of their city as uh, trustworthy as respecting hospitality agreements because then people won't be afraid of them people won't invade them in order to try to control them and um, they won't have to build up a strong military so it's really important that the leaders generation after generation establish their city as a city that's trustworthy and also that basically has goodwill for other city-states. Um, they'll be left alone. They're more likely to be left alone. They're also, they shouldn't go to war for unnecessary reasons. Um, anyway, so this is the obligation of the nobility. And obviously they, um, they violate that in many ways. Um, so the play itself is trying to educate the nobility. Um, Hecuba is smart and so as always she uses this power of rhetoric and this is in all the plays but it's particularly with Hecuba that she she understands the power of speech to motivate people to do the right thing which is what she was asking Odysseus to do with his troops and then she also understands the power of speech to uh, punch people's buttons and get them to do the wrong thing. Um, so that's a part of every educated and powerful person has to know that they should use that power of speech correctly. There's also the power of scientific knowledge, scientific reasoning when you're gathering facts. There's a difference between having the facts and really drawing the right inference in terms of leadership, in terms of the future of your society. Um, perhaps somebody should be punished, but in a situation it might not be the best thing to do for the future of your city. Um, justice has to be tempered with mercy. Um, let's see. Oh, the good sense, having the good sense to forgive people. Um, that's another thing they lack. They all want power. They all um, are uh, proud, excessively proud. So if you hurt them, they overreact. Um, they also don't have good se excellence in deliberation. Okay. So supposedly they all want peace and justice and all that wonderful stuff. But when it comes down to the situation, what are the options? What, is, what are the real options that we could, what can we actually choose? Then which option is best? Um, and they're all wrong. Each one of them makes the wrong judgment. Odysseus to kill Polyxena, Agamemnon to let a Hecuba have the the private meeting, 
uh, Polly Nestor to kill uh, Polly Doris and Hecuba to take revenge. So they all have reasons. They're just not wise. They have the wrong idea of the good. Um, also, it's about personal responsibility. They're all trying to uh, blame somebody else or blame circumstances when it's clear from the play that they do have the power to do the right thing and it would have made a lot of difference to the future of their city and to the degree of trust other city-states would have in their city and goodwill and their own capacity to be self-sufficient, to be able to take care of themselves and not either attack others out of love of power or be attacked by others out of fear that they love power too much. Um, okay, so, so let's talk about tragedy as a literary, um, as a kind of literature. Um, it, the play has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, it's, it's based on a, it's based on a certain type. It's an archetype. All the characters are good in the sense that they, um, you can identify with them. They all have some idea of the good and of the good. It's a serious question. Okay. They all have an idea of the good to the point where anybody could identify with them, even though they do some horrible things. I think that, you know, the way Odysseus is thinking, it seems right. It's just not right. Um, and the way Agamemnon thinks. So you have to get in his shoes, and then you have to learn that even though something seems right, it's not. Because the audience has that broader point of view, that higher perspective, the perspective of the higher moral order that's at work in spite of what these people think. Um, let's see. The, he says... Aristotle says they're different types, the better, the worse, the intermediate. Um, I think Hecuba, you know, she could be, by the end, seem worse than the average person, but she's really been stretched. I mean, she has really suffered. And I think one of the lessons is um, don't treat women, <laughs> that those guys in patriarchy have to start treating women differently because treating them as the spoils of war is creating a lot of problems and a lot of injustices and a lot of breakdown in trust between the soldiers and the leaders and between one city-state and another um, and also the mother-child bond is really strong and if you decimate that in a woman she's going to come back so that's the story of Demeter, right? You rape and abduct her daughter, she starves you out. So um, the other lesson is women are not intellectually inferior to men. <laughs> they are the equals of men, at least. Hecuba is smarter and more subtle and everything than any of those guys. They come across as real idiots by comparison. So. I think Euripides is saying you need to treat women uh, with respect and treat them as intelligent because they have the power to do good and they have the power to do bad. So don't uh, say things like they're by nature incapable of theoretical thinking or thinking about citizenship or leadership because obviously Hecuba is capable. Plus, Polyxena is totally capable of acting nobly at the absolutely highest level. Um, they all express their thought through speech. Um, they all have ideas of good and evil and justice and injustice. They all suffer. Um, and the cause of, then they make each other suffer. And this suffering is unnecessary. I mean, the thing about tragedy, it's trying to educate you about don't make choices that lead to unnecessary suffering. There's plenty of suffering in life. 
just based on the frailty and vulnerability of the human condition. But don't do the things that make it even worse. Um, and one of those things is to want more power than you can have, is to deny your interdependence on other people and other city-states. Um, the plot is the most important. People don't necessarily go from happiness to misery, but they don't always get it, right? And there's supposed to be a reversal and recognition from ignorance to wisdom. As in so many of the documents, the characters don't learn, but the audience is supposed to learn. Every one of these lessons, every one of these mistakes uh, has a lesson. Um, okay. Okay, so there's supposed to be a catharsis of pity and fear. The story is obviously poetry, not history. The characters are types. They're in a type of situation. They're the type of people that would respond in this type of way. So that we go from just memory of historical events to reminiscence or pattern recognition. So people could be in situations like Odysseus or Agamemnon or Polynestor or Hecuba, and they could, hopefully if they're educated, they would think, oh my gosh, this is just like polynester, and I'm tempted to do this. Don't do it, because just think about the lesson of that play. So, um, so it follows that um, criteria. Um, okay, so the whole implication, what's implicit throughout the writing of tragedy, the performance of tragedy, the growth and development of tragedy within the context of Athenian culture is, again, the same stuff. The desire for wisdom is the only way to avoid either chaos or tyranny, authoritarian government. Uh, the play shows why we should seek wisdom, how we should seek wisdom, it's the life of the mind is dialectical and self-critical. There's more than one side to everything, and the play gives all the arguments, the best arguments. Um, but it's clear some choices are better than others. Um, emotion is corruptible. Human reason is spiritual. People are seeking to live justly and virtuously. They're going to act on the basis of the claim of some higher principle, right? Those higher principles. And the, they're deluded about what the principle is. It's higher than what they think it is. And they don't have as much power to embody or uh, make good those principles as they think they do. The principles are something they have to limit themselves in order for the principles of good and evil, of good, to prevail. Human reason is creative. People have the power to make their lives and the lives of their cities better or worse. Human reason is the only source of our hope. There's no other way <laughs> that we're going to save ourselves or our cities except through reasoning through mind, through wisdom. Um, the gods are not arbitrary. We're not playthings of the gods. We're not victims of the gods. We're also not, um, the, the world is ordered. It's not, the world is not run, uh, does not exist on a principle of randomness and chance. There's patterns and you need to learn the patterns and you need to learn the lessons and you need to live, make the right choices in the critical moment. Human beings can't live without hope, and acting on irras irrational emotions destroys hope. So, um, luck and chance have no power compared to reason. We create our future as a species, and there are limitations of human choice, and there 
is real. Human choice really makes a difference. So ultimately, the whole context of the tragedy is optimistic. Um, Euripides is part of a tradition that is based on the belief that people can learn. They have minds. They're capable of using them. If you can write a tragedy that gets them emotionally, it has to touch people emotionally. They have to be motivated to want to learn the lesson, to want to change or grow or become wiser. They have to want to go to the taverna and talk about this and what they learned. And um, so anyway, that's, that's the tradition. And I wrote on these three, di three tragedies, one by each of the tragedians. Um, that's all I've written so far. Uh, part of me would just love to go and look at more of them, but <laughs> probably going to die first. Um, so, th what I want to convey to people is hopefully I've set down a pattern for how to read tragedies, some ideas, lots of ideas about how they fit the theories in Aristotle, um, about how important they were in terms of cu the development of culture, and um, that other people would pick up on my ideas. Obviously, they might disagree, agree. It's a dialogue. How can, it's not a doctrine. Um, but I would hope they would find in more of the tragedies these insights that I think are, are just unbelievably incredible. I just, <laughs> I just, my jaw drops when I'm writing these books and thinking about, oh my gosh, how did they know all that, how how well organized every line has all these implications and insights, and what a phenomenal kind of educational system that is. And it reaches out to such a high, high percentage of people in the society. It's not isolated to students in private liberal arts colleges. It's out there, you know, the plays are being shown in the public realm. Everybody can go. Of course, now we have women, right? Women go and we don't have people uh, playing the role of slaves. But we definitely have people with different capacities, different abilities to rule and be ruled, to understand things. But everyone can get educated to this high level of self-critical awareness, self-examination. Um, and it's just so exciting and it's so important at this time in history when we're developing this global culture and the prevailing media presentation is that it's all about sex and power and <laughs> the Greeks are always telling you no no <laughs> it's about wisdom and becoming a healthy species in a, a world that is intelligible and we need to use our power of choice to live um, in a sustainable way according to our personal limits, our social limits, and our limits as a species.